In Formula 1 history, there have been a plethora of brilliant cars piloted by fantastic drivers to a multitude of race wins and championships. From innovative icons that changed the design philosophy for all future competitors, such as the Lotus 25 which pioneered the monocoque chassis, the 78 also designed by Colin Chapman that used ground effect technology, or the Renault RS01 that was the first F1 car to be powered by a turbocharged engine. So many other changes and improvements, such as engine configurations, aerofoil wings, and the shift from manual to semi-automatic to fully autonomous gearboxes, then back to semi-automatic gearboxes, have come into our sport, with varying levels of success and longevity. It's these wild or groundbreaking cars that tend to lead races and win championships, but even the most dominant cars have blips, and thus there's no time in history where one constructor has won 100% of the Formula 1 World Championship races in a given season. On the flip side, just like none of the best machines have ever won every race, sometimes it's mediocre ones that take glory. There have been plenty of times where due to luck, individual brilliance from a driver, or a mix of both, where an underdog team achieved the impossible. There are stories, like with Pastor Maldonado at the 2012 Spanish Grand Prix, where the Venezuelan managed not to stuff his car into the barriers every five seconds like he usually did and won in a car that finished 8th in the Constructors' Championship, and only got one other top 5 finish, and no other podiums. Rumours say that Williams were given special tyres for that race, so Maldonado could win a race just after Frank Williams' 70th birthday, but that's not confirmed. Instances where a driver won more due to luck than due to skill include Johnny Herbert of the 1999 European Grand Prix, where several drivers ahead of him had failures, or Olivier Panis, who won a 1996 Monaco Grand Prix, where no one else wanted to finish. However, all of the examples I've just mentioned are ones where midfield teams won a race, as Stewart, Ligier and Williams would have finished 5th, 7th and 8th in the Constructors' Championships without their victories. The Ligier team would have only scored 2 points in 1996 if it wasn't for Panis' triumph, but there's never been a truly backmarker team that's won a race. Or has there been? The most well-documented underdog win in Formula 1 history is probably the win that Giancarlo Fisichella took for Jordan at the 2003 Brazilian Grand Prix, where the Italian made an early pit stop for fuel before continuing until the race was red flagged on lap 56, after Mark Webber and Fernando Alonso suffered big collisions on the pit straight. Initially, it was believed that Kimi Raikkonen had won after the laps were counted back, but after some deliberation and a trophy presentation held before the next race at Imola, the plucky Jordan driver was awarded the win. The Irish team scored three other points during 2003 thanks to Fisichella and his teammate Ralph Furman, but finished ninth in the standings, although they would have stayed ahead of the pointless Minardi without their shock win. That's the lowest constructors finish for a race winning team in F1 history. That is, apart from one other. After the longest intro on YouTube right now, let me tell you the story of another spontaneous win from the worst victorious car in F1 history. Jim Clark drives the Formula One Lotusport to victory on the racetracks of the world. And look at that! How that and colossally that's Mansell! That is Nigel Mansell! Callum Frost has taken the advantage! Senna is trying to go through on the inside and it's happened immediately! This is amazing! Senna goes off at the first corner! And I've got to stop because I've got a lump in my throat. The Marge team were a staple of Formula One during the 1970s. The name of the outfit was actually an acronym of the initials of its four founders, Max Mosley, Alan Rees, Graham Coker and Robin Hurd. They achieved a third place finish in the constructor standings in their first year in 1970 with Chris Amon and Joe Siffert at the wheel. I'm going to do a video on Amon at some point, and Siffert featured heavily in one of my previous works centred around Switzerland's impact in Formula One. They also fielded non-works entries driven by privateers, including the Tyrrell team who took March's first win in only the manufacturer's second race in Harama, courtesy of Jackie Stewart. 1971 saw the perennially underrated Swede Ronnie Peterson finish second in the Drivers' Championship behind Stewart, as despite taking no wins for March, he scored four second places in Monaco, Silverstone, Monza and Mossport, and another podium in Watkins Glen. After a shaky season in 1972, which saw less success, and March give Nicky Lauda his F1 debut, 
Peterson left to join Lotus, and thus the works team scored no points for the first time. However, the new Heskiff outfit with James Hunt at the wheel scored 14 points and two podiums to save the blushers from Arch. Lord Heskiff's team moved to making custom chassis midway through 1974, and thus only the new recruits Hans Joachim Stuck and Vittoria Rambia scored points, which mean they'd gone from third and fourth to the standings in 1970 and 71 to fifth, sixth, then ninth in 1972, 73, and 74. Brambia stayed on full-time heading into 1975, but would be the team's only entry for the first two races in Argentina and Brazil. He finished 9th in Buenos Aires after qualifying 12th and 2.5 and seconds away from pole, then had engine failure on lap 2 at Interlagos from 17th on the grid. From South Africa onwards, Brambia was joined by fellow Italian Lella Lombardi, who had only one F1 race entry to her name, as she had attempted but failed to qualify for the British Grand Prix the year prior. Brambia qualified 7th in Kyle Army, with Lombardi 26th, but both drivers retired from the race with radiator and fuel system problems for Vittorio and Lella, respectively. Brambia continued his fantastic qualifying form in the bad car by putting himself in 5th position on the grid for the Spanish Grand Prix, while Lombardi was 6 seconds behind in 24th. Then at the start, Vittorio tangled with Mario Andretti, Niki Lauda and Clay Regazzoni. Lauda retired while Regazzoni pitted for repairs. The high-up March driver was running fifth when he pitted and rejoined. However, a few laps later, tragedy struck. The race leader, Rolf Stommelen, who was driving an Embassy Hill, crashed into the Armco barriers, coming out of one of the corners, and his car vaulted over it, killing four people. The race was stopped two laps later on safety grounds, as there had been problems with the walls all weekend, with race officials refusing to even bolt the things together, so they'd, you know, work as barriers? Brambia was classified 5th with Lombardi 6th, which meant that March had their first double points finish for two works team cars in their history. However, as the race had been halted before 75% distance had been completed, only half points were awarded, and thus the two March drivers scored one point for 5th and half a point for 6th. Lombardi is still the only woman to score a point in F1 history, even though she was arguably much worse of a driver than the likes of Desiree Wilson or Davina Galitza. Brambia retired due to a collision in Monaco, while Lombardi failed to qualify five seconds behind. Both drivers retired in Zolder, although Brambia qualified third. Then in Sweden, Brambia continued his fantastic qualifying form, although in dubious circumstances. His team's part of the pit wall where they stuck out boards with information for the driver in the days before team radio was right before the start finishing line. Thus, they realised that if they stuck something in front of a timing beam before their driver crossed the line, then the clock would stop early. They stopped the clocks early, but not enough to raise alarm bells, as Brambia took pole by four tenths of a second from Patrick Depaillet. Lombardi was four seconds behind in 24th. Vittorio led 16 laps, but later retired with transmission failure, and Lombardi also retired. Brambia took his 4th and 5th retirement on the bounce in Zandvoort and Paul Ricard, while Lombardi was 14th, then 18th. Then at Silverstone, the team started running a third car for the returning Hans Joachim Stuck. Brambia took only his third finish from his 10th start that season, and scored a point for 6th place, which took the team to 2.5 points scored across that season. Then, they got another two points from Mark Donoghue getting fifth in a customer march in the same race. Lombardi got seventh on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, then there came the race on the Österreich ring. Brambia qualified eighth, with Lombardi 22nd. During practice, both Brian Henton and Wilson Fittipaldi crashed, with Fittipaldi breaking two bones, while on the Sunday warm-up, Mark Donoghue had a tyre failure going through Turn 1, and he was killed along with a marshal that was hit by his out-of-control car. Donahue was 38. On Sunday, as the grid began to form up, rain was falling on the far side of the track. The cars thus returned to the pits to change onto wet tyres and returned back to their positions on the start line 45 minutes later. Lauda led from the off, followed by James Hunt's Heskiff, with Patrick Depaillet in third. Hans Joachim Stuck was fourth, then came Emerson Fittipaldi, Brambier in sixth, and Jody Schechter in seventh. However, the Italian marchman made his way past Fittipaldi, Stuck and Depaille into the top three. Lauda lost the lead on lap 15 as the Austrian was struggling with a car not suited to the wet conditions and thus fell backwards. 
Hunt was now leading Brambia, however his car was down to seven cylinders, meaning he was unable to shake off his unrelenting adversary. On the 19th tour of the circuit, as the pair came up to lap, Brett Lunger, who was competing in his first wet weather F1 race, the American didn't see them behind in the mirrors, and thus Brambia pounced, overtaking Hunt and Lunger in one fail swoop. Hunt was stuck behind Lunger for another two laps before he managed to get past. Peterson had to pit to replace a faulty visor, whilst the Brabham drivers found they had been racing with a mix and match of tyres, with their own rear tyres and one of their teammates, which must have been fun. After Jock and Mass spun out from the podium positions, the Grand Prix Drivers Association, or GPDA, stepped in to try and get the race stopped on safety grounds. The officials relented, and thus decided to wave the chequered flag after 29 of the 54 laps scheduled had been run, ironically the same total that was seen before the Spanish Grand Prix was stopped earlier in the year. As Brambia crossed the finish line with the chequered flag waving, he lost control of his car. He was known as the Monza Gorilla for his aggressive driving style, but to take your only race win while crashing out is something not even Andre de Cesare's could come up with. Brambia was the oldest driver on the grid, aged 37 after Graham Hill had retired earlier on in the year, and he'd taken his first victory. By the way, Hill is a driver I've covered in another video if you'd like to check it out in the top right corner of your screen. Back to Brambia. As the race had completed less than 75% distance, half points were awarded, just like at Montjuic. He received four and a half points for his victory, and he would never finish on an F1 podium again. After a triple retirement from him, Lombardi and Stuck in Monza, Brambia and his German teammate scored 7th and 8th in the season finale at Watkins Glen. Now, if we use today's point system, the March team would have scored 48 points across 1975. However, in reality, they scored 7.5 points across the season, which would have been 6.5 if it wasn't for the customer team Penske getting 5th with Donahue at Silverstone. Four and a half of their six and a half points came from Vittorio's victory, and without it, they would have finished 12th in the Constructors' Championship, only ahead of Ensign on one point, and eight other teams who were unclassified. Some people might hear this story and say that while Marge would have finished lower than the 2003 Jordan team without the win, as Marge would have been 12th while Jordan were 9th, that doesn't necessarily make the 1975 March worse. Obviously, you have to point out the fact that there were 21 constructors in 1975 instead of 10 in 2003, so by default, Jordan couldn't have been worse than March on the pure numbers. You can also point at the several top 10 qualifying finishes Brambia got and say that Jordan weren't capable of that. But where I think the March falls down isn't the raw performance. It was a midfield car that in the hands of an exuberant driver who pushed the limits more than everyone else was always going to get the odd great qualifying position. If Stuck had been in the second seat for most of the year instead of Lombardi, who despite being a pioneer for women in motorsport, was to put it nicely, not F1 material, and to put it bluntly, awful, then I think we could have seen more accurately where the march stood on pace. But as I just said, the march's mediocrity wasn't in raw performance, it was in fact its reliability. That year, March had a 70% retirement rate, only finishing 11 times out of their 30 different race entries across the season. Nearly all of the car's top 10s, and all of its points finishers disregarding the win in Austria, were in attritional races. The opening round at Argentina, where Brambia got 9th, was the only one on merit really. In Spain, only 8 cars finished, and they were 5th and 6th, ahead only of Tony Bryce and the FWRC Williams, another team I've covered in another video, and John Watson, who was in a pointless certes. During the British race at Silverstone, 16 of the 26 starters had accidents and only 6 cars were still going at race's end because most people crashed out when it started chucking it down with hailstones. On the Nordschleife, Lombardi finished 7th out of 9 cars still racing, only ahead of Patrick Depaye who'd lost a lap in the pits trying to repair his suspension, and Harold Ertel in the Hesketh. Oh, and I'd just like to point out, Lombardi was 7 minutes and 30 seconds off the lead after the 14 laps of the Nordschleife, meaning she was losing on average 32 seconds a lap over the 7 minute course. Then at Watkins Glen, Brambia and Stuck only finished ahead of John Watson's Penske and the Fittipaldi family team's car driven by Wilson Fittipaldi. If it wasn't for dumb luck, or if you want to believe it, skill, that they avoided chaos in massively attritional races, then without the luck or skill, the Works March team would have been completely pointless in 1975 if not for the Austrian Grand Prix victory. 
Jordan also benefited from only 12 cars finishing in both their other point scores in 2003, but they were fairly beating cars that should have been faster than them. Going back to the Österreich ring, by the way, it had a penchant for giving drivers their first wins, as John Watson took his first triumph there in 1976, the year after Brambia, followed by Alan Jones in 1977, also giving each of their teams their first win. It's actually crazy to think that Austria gave not just three drivers their first win, three years running, but if we're only talking about works teams, then after giving it to March in 1975, Penske got their first in 1976, and Shadow in 1977. That would be like Haas and Nico Hülkenberg winning their first race at Kota one year, then Racing Bulls winning with Sonoda the next, then Stake getting one with Joe. I know Racing Bulls used to be Toro Rosso, and I know Stake used to be BMW Sauber, so maybe there's a caveat to saying it would be their first wins, but it'd still be mental. But anyways, enough of my statistical quirks. I think that concludes today's video on what is, in my opinion, the worst car to win an F1 Grand Prix in history. I hope you all enjoyed it, and if you did, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to see more content from me in the future. Big shout out to my Patreon subscribers, Andy Lamberts, Eamon Al Dowdy, and Jack Bassett, and if you'd like to get access to videos a day before they go live on YouTube, subscribe to my Patreon for as little as $1 per month. Also, follow my Instagram where I try to post regular updates and behind the scenes content. Links to the Patreon and Instagram are in the description. With that being said, I'll stop boring you with my shameless plugging, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. I'm Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!